Hello, everybody. Thanks for attending the webinar today. My name is Melissa Schwartz, and I'm an account manager here with Training Peaks. I also have Kelly Bays on the line. Kelly's going to be helping us field questions. She is an account manager as well here with Training Peaks. The webinar today is going to be five stages of achieving optimum body composition. And before we get started and before I hand it over to, to Dr. Rick Katu, I just want to start with a little bit of housekeeping items. Um, number one, I just want to remind everybody that we're going to have some downtime this evening starting at 9 p.m. Eastern time. We're just doing a little bit of site maintenance and we're also bringing some new features to trainingpeaks.com. So um, we will be posting on Facebook and posting on Twitter once it's back up. It shouldn't take too long, but just a good thing to know about. Also, if you have a question for um, Dr. Katouf while he's going through his presentation, feel free to ask it. Do you have a little question area in the GoToWebinar panel that you can uh, that you can ask questions to? So submit your questions there, and Kelly and I will be um, answering questions as they go along. If you have some training questions, you can also submit them there, and Kelly and I will be trying to answer them as they come in as well. We will have a little bit of time at the end for Q&A for Rick to answer questions. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Dr. Rick Katouf. So let me oh. change presenter so that you have it. All right, so you should be able to share your computer now. Wonderful, Melissa. Thank you very much. I want to thank uh, Melissa and everybody at Training Peaks for the opportunity to put on this webinar. It's going to be exciting today, the five stages to achieving optimum body composition. And let me say thank you to everybody in attendance as well. So I'm excited for the next hour. And like Melissa said, questions that you have, we'll try to get to as many of those at the end of the presentation. And questions that are not answered, hopefully we can get to those uh, sometime after the presentation. So. Again, like Melissa said, uh, my name is uh, Rick Katouf, CEO and founder of Team Katouf Inc., author of Forever Fit, and host of three DVD set RX Nutrition. I'll just give you a quick brief background on myself, and, and then we'll get started right into uh, the presentation. I practiced optometry for eight years, so from an education standpoint, that's my background. I went to the Illinois College of Optometry in Chicago, and I, I realized quickly that my true passion was health and fitness. And I had started my coaching business over 20 years ago. And I decided, I said, you know what, I'm going I'm to pursue my passion. I want to make health and fitness where, where I go in my life. So in 2004, I decided to start Team Katufin, turn it into an online business. And since then, I've just been extremely fortunate. It's been just a wonderful ride. Having built the business worldwide, I've coached individuals all over the U.S., all around the world, in the United Kingdom, Canada, Africa, Sri Lanka. And the, the wonderful thing is I have such a wide range of clientele that just make it so much fun. Everybody from general fitness, those that are morbidly obese and just looking to get healthy, to the professional athlete and everybody in between. So it's just been absolutely wonderful having the business of Team Katouf and having the ability to have my wife, Gail, uh, work with me in part of the business as well. So there's a little bit of background. and. I kind of want to get started with the presentation here. Okay, here we go. Again, there's uh, just some more information there about RX Nutrition and the book I authored, Forever Fit. So here we go, the five stages to achieving optimum body composition. I, I love this topic so much. So many individuals come into exercise and fitness and training and racing for many different reasons, all very personal for each and every one of us. But I do feel over the years there's been a common theme. So many people start to exercise, start to work out, start to choose to jump into racing, whether it's cycling, running, or multi-sport, because one of their main goals is to make some body composition change, have some weight loss change. I like to talk about body composition change as opposed to just weight loss. So this is one young lady you'll see as she starts to make her transformation into some really nice body composition changes once we start to implement these five stages. So you can kind of see the transformation starting to happen here. And as we progress, you can see some additional changes. And 
one of the big things we'll talk about too today of one of the five stages is what I call the mind-body connection. These limiting beliefs that sometimes we can have that can hold us back from success. You'll hear me talk about how the mind can be our biggest asset or our biggest limiter. We want to make sure that our mind is our biggest asset to allow us to achieve those goals that we set for ourselves. So what are the five stages to achieving optimum body composition? Here we go. We're going to talk about each one, some nice detail of each, probably go into a little bit more depth on the nutrition side, and then I'm going to show you and give you some real life examples of individuals of how they implemented these five stages in the body transformation, the body composition changes, and the mind-body changes they were able to achieve. So the five stages are this, nutrition, strength training, cardiovascular training, recovery, and then the mind-body connection, our beliefs. The strength training to me is one of the most interesting, probably, gosh, one of the most controversial that over the years so many individuals still sometimes have a belief that weight training or resistance training is not good for us as endurance athletes, so we'll address that today. I like this cartoon here. Do you know anyone that this has happened to? The Yo-Yo Diet Barbie inflates to twice original size dieting. I, I talk about in Forever Fit how the word diet is just absolutely disastrous. Diets have a finish line. Diets don't work. They're not lifestyles. They're very temporary. We're going to get that word diet out of our vocabulary and really change this into a true lifestyle. So let me ask you this. Have you seen a common scenario like this, whether it's with yourself or with somebody else, a coworker or fellow athlete? has been dieting, has lost 20 pounds over the last three months. You might think, man, great, this is fantastic, right? Well, maybe, maybe not. We have to ask ourselves this. Of that 20 pounds, what have they lost? Has it been fat? Has it been muscle? Has it been water? At what cost? Did somebody lose that weight and simply get dehydrated? Did they waste some precious lean muscle? Did their performance, was it affected or was their performance accelerated? Did they lose the right amount of weight? Was the body composition correct in terms of what they lost? Did it affect their metabolism? Did it affect their overall health? So these are all questions we want to ask. When somebody says to me, hey, Rick, I just lost or I just gained 10 pounds, what does that mean? My answer is I don't know what it means because I don't know what somebody lost or what somebody gained. It's not a matter of gaining or losing weight. It's a matter of what did we gain and what did we lose. And then we know exactly where we're at from a body composition perspective. What we want to avoid is what we call muscle wasting. No, no, no. I think it's great that you exercise and diet. I just wonder if perhaps you exercise and diet too much. We're going to talk about preventing what we call muscle wasting. Lean muscle, you hear me talk about it a lot, a lot today in the next hour, how precious lean muscles. We don't want to waste that lean muscle. So a question is, how do we get meaningful and sustainable, meaningful and sustainable weight loss and body composition change? Well, meaningful, meaning this, one does not experience a detriment in training and performance or other harmful effects to one's body. That's what dieting, that's what caloric restriction, that's what deprivation of food and calories can do to us. We don't want to go that route. We want to make sure we eat right. You're going to hear me talk about a big difference, folks, between eating healthy and eating right. A lot of people are out there eating healthy, but you know what? It's not right, and there's a big difference. We're going to address that today. And manageable, manageable forever, a true lifestyle. We want to make it sustainable. So let's start talking about the strength training and resistance training. Like I said earlier, probably one of the most controversial elements of training that I've seen from individuals over the years, there still seems to be a resistance, no pun intended, a resistance to resistance training, especially for that endurance athlete. I hear so many people say, oh, man, Rick, I, I don't want to weight train. I don't want to put on bulk. I don't want to put on mass. Uh, a lot of people say, well, gosh, I, I heard that uh, as a cyclist or as a multi-sport athlete or as a runner, people say, well, I've heard that the weight training can impair or impede my performance. Well, folks, I'm here to tell you this. Whether it's body composition change, performance in sport, either one or a combination of both, strength training and resistance training, if you're not doing it, is going to be one of your biggest secret weapons to add to your training program. And I am a huge believer of performing it year-round. What I see a lot is during these months, the months we're in right now, maybe November, 
December, January, February. Many times I'll see endurance athletes embrace strength training and weight training during that time, but I'll also see them step on the brakes around March or April and not touch it again until the winter time or the non-racing season starts to roll around. So the reason weight training and resistance training is so important, folks, is we want to build lean muscle. If we're looking for body composition change, what's that mean? We want to reduce our body fat percentage. We want to increase our body water percentage. And I'm telling you right now, I want to get everybody off of the train of focusing on body weight. I don't want to minimize it. I know body weight is important to individuals. And yes, it is important. But I want everybody to focus on the numbers that truly matter. And that's body fat percentage and body water percentage. These numbers are easily measured. I love using a body composition scale. It'll measure everything you need, your body fat percentage, your body water percentage, your body weight, depending on what scale you purchase, a lot more bells and whistles. You can measure a lot more things. But it's amazing what numbers these can give us. I want you to start to track these numbers if you're not already. And these are things you can easily do in Training Peaks is track these metrics. So going into your Training Peaks account, you can go into your metrics and you can record so many things from your body weight to your body fat percentage. You might say, gosh, why would we want our urine color? I'll talk about this from a hydration perspective. I, I want people to become experts on shades of yellow. Oh my gosh, our urine color can tell the entire story about where we are from a hydration perspective. So let's go back to the strength training. When we do the strength training, I want both upper body and lower body to be performed. I want to build lean muscle because once we build the lean muscle, we can burn that body fat. We can get the body composition change we want. I'll ask you a question. I'm sure everybody would have pretty much the same answer. So many times when individuals are ready to lose some weight, it's the first of the year coming up. They want to make some New Year's resolutions. I want to lose some weight. I'm going to get to the gym tomorrow at 530. They say to themselves, okay, I want to lose weight. What type of exercise or activity do I want to do? And 99.9% .9 of the people are going to gravitate towards what type of exercise. You and I both know it's going to be cardiovascular exercise. No doubt about it. I realize that's common in conventional thinking. But I'm here to tell you this, folks. Cardiovascular training is not the answer to body composition change. Now, absolutely, for sport-specific training, yeah, we've got to do it. We've got to do the swim, bike, run if we're a multi-sport athlete, if we're a cyclist, if we're a runner. We've got to do those activities. But what I'm saying is this. We've got to make sure the resistance training is in there, especially if we want those body composition changes that we desire. Because if all we do is cardiovascular activity and we think that that is going to change our body, it is not. It's not going to get us that lean muscle we want. It's not going to get us that body fat drop that we are looking for. So let's start to measure using a body composition scale or other modality the body fat the body water percentage, obviously the body weight. But again, take care of business, start to build some lean muscle, start to burn that body fat. Now, not only will the resistance training help you from a body composition perspective, but in terms of strength, power, speed, endurance, recovery, injury prevention, I could go on and on. Resistance training has so many benefits for us. So. Although it's still controversial today, I'm telling you right now, if you're doing it, great, congratulations, keep it up. If you're not, start adding in, and I'm telling you what, almost immediately you'll start to notice positive results. Let's go on to number two, utilizing proper heart rate intensities. When I lecture around the country, I'll ask this question, I'll ask the audience, I'll say, okay, I want to see a show of hands. How many individuals out there use a heart rate monitor when they train, when they work out? And majority of the hands will go up. The next question is this, keep your hands up now, how many of you out there know exactly what those numbers mean and majority of the hands start to go back down? So we want to understand why is heart rate training, why are heart rates so critical? I look at the heart like this, folks. It's the body's barometer. It's the body's tachometer. Imagine a race car driver driving their car, not, not having a tachometer, not knowing what the engine is doing. There's a very good chance they can blow that engine. Well, the heart is the body's tachometer. The heart rate is going to tell the story by following the proper heart rates in training. This is what not only is going to help us get the body composition change that we desire, 
but it's going to help us from a performance perspective, from a recovery perspective, from a efficiency. You'll hear me talk a lot today about efficiency perspective. Now, one of the most important components that I utilize with those individuals I work with is lactic acid threshold. I'm sure you have all heard that term before. I'll kind of give you a Cliff Notes version. What is LT? What is lactic acid threshold? Well, Cliff Notes version is this. It's the point at which, it's, it's a heart rate, the point at which our body cannot utilize the amount, of, cannot buffer or utilize the amount of lactate products that are, in the, that are in the system, okay? Once we start to go above that, hey, we've all been there in training, we've all been there in racing, and it's not real pleasant, and the body shortly thereafter is going to start to shut down. So what's the goal of heart rate training when it comes to body composition training? Now, for body composition changing. The tough part is this, for those individuals that have not been strict with heart rate training, it is one of the biggest changes that they need to make when it comes to their training. Because here's what I want, folks, here's what I want for everybody. I want everybody out there listening to get a bigger return on your investment of time of training. I want you to get a bigger return on your investment of time of training, and by following the proper heart rates, that is going to help us out. Once we know our lactic acid threshold, now how do we test that? Well, without going into a ton of detail, there's, there's obviously laboratories out there, colleges, things of that nature that have exercise science or exercise physiology departments where you can get your lactic acid threshold done. If you're a multi-sport athlete, make sure that you test it on both the bike and the run. Now, because those heart rate values can be different and sometimes drastically different on the run versus the bike. Now, you don't need a laboratory. You can test these in training, okay, a number of different ways, and feel free to contact me you know, after the webinar. We can talk about some different ways we can do that. But once we know that lactic acid threshold, now it's time for that body to start training in those proper heart rates. Now, I realize the word slow can be a very, very, very negative term for athletes because athletes say, hey, man, I'm in this sport. I want to get faster. I want to get stronger. I want to have more endurance and they start following these proper heart rates, especially the lower heart rate zone, especially on the run, and they're like, oh my gosh, Rick, I'm running so slow, how am I ever going to get faster? So I get it, I understand, that's, that's conventional thinking. Let me share this with you. The word we want to work on, folks, is efficiency. I want to teach that body to become more efficient. Here's what I mean by efficiency. Teaching the body to go harder, longer, faster, at the same or lower heart rate. Increased efficiency, once again, is teaching the body to go longer, harder, faster at the same or lower heart rate. I'm telling you folks, if you haven't seen this happen, look out, because when it does, you have just reached an entirely new level of fitness. And when efficiency starts to increase, your speed, your strength, your power, your endurance is all increasing with it. So let me give you a quick example. How can we, how can we objectively test our efficiency? When we look at heart rate zones, we can set them as, for example, zone one, two, three, four, five, six, et cetera. Zone one being the lowest heart rate zone, zone four, five, six being the higher heart rate zone. So let's say somebody's testing themselves in that lower heart rate zone, in that zone one. And let's just throw out a number. Let's say their zone one running pace per mile, follow me on this now, is, let's just throw out a number, nine minutes per mile, okay? Now, what they're gonna notice in time is they continue to train properly. It's not a matter of training slow, it's a matter of training smarter. As they continue to train properly in the right heart rate zone, teaching the body to burn fat as the primary fuel source, teaching the body to spare glycogen and to burn fat as the primary fuel source, that nine minute pace at zone one, over time, will become 845, 830, 815, eight minutes, etc. Just imagine. Taking your nine-minute pace in zone one, the, 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 the lowest heart rate zone you have, down to eight minutes at the exact same heart rate. You want to talk about increased efficiency. Now, what has that done to your ceiling? What's that done to your higher end? It's just increased that ceiling or higher end for you. That's where the speed and the increase in endurance and stamina start to follow. You heard me use a term just a few seconds ago called glycogen. Think of glycogen like fuel for the body. When we eat carbohydrate, glycogen is formed and stored in the muscles, muscle glycogen, some stored in our liver as well. Well, as an endurance athlete and as an individual trying to make body composition changes, losing body fat, losing body weight, we want to teach the body to spare glycogen and utilize fat as our primary fuel source. 
How do we do it? Proper heart rate training. I'm telling you folks, once you start to adapt this and adopt this into your training, it is game on. Great things start to happen. Many of you out there are probably already doing it and seeing great results, and we want to stick with that. Now, I'll touch on quickly. Again, there's a lot of proponents that say, well, you know, I, I, I did or maybe I wanted to follow heart rate, but I'm a, I'm a cyclist or I'm a multi-sport athlete, and um, I, I want to follow strictly power. I'm a, I'm a huge proponent of power as well. I've been using power since 1997. Tons of benefits using power. All I'm going to say is this, though. Heart rate folks are going to tell us the entire story about what our body is doing. Because if we're working out on a certain day or a couple days and we're noticing a higher than normal heart rate, it's telling us something, folks. Are we underslept? Are we overstressed? Are we overtrained? Are we dehydrated? The heart rates are going to tell you so much about the body. So as we start to follow those proper heart rates, we're going to start to notice that body composition starts to change. Let me ask you this. When most people, again, remember we talked about how, how the cardiovascular activity is the one type of exercise most people gravitate towards if they want to lose weight, albeit not correct because we want to do the strength training. What else do individuals do? They think more is better or harder is better. So not only are they doing cardiovascular activity, they're doing it harder, man. They're going into those spin classes or group cycling classes, and they are getting after it. But the problem is I'm not going to tell you they're training too hard. That's a negative to somebody. I'm going to tell you this, though. They're not training to proper heart rate zones. And too often, here's the common scenario. You may know people like this, or you yourself may have fallen into this. It's time. You're ready. You want to start making some body comp changes. You're working out X amount. You're eating X amount. All of a sudden, you're realizing, oh, my gosh, I'm doing all this work, not getting the results. What's going on? What's the next logical step people take? I'll be it wrong, but the next logical step is this. I'm going to start eating less working out more and even harder, and all of a sudden, man, more negative starts to, start, starts to come right around the corner. So that's why the proper heart rates are absolutely critical. Okay, let's move on to the next component. One of the most interesting, now let me first tell you, this, this is a joke, folks, so we don't want to take our loaf of Wonder Bread with us, but I thought this was a great photo that, that somebody sent to me. Let's get into detail about the nutritional components. There's five of them. The proper nutrient timing, the proper macronutrient combinations. What are the three macronutrients? Carbohydrates, protein, and dietary fat. Number three, the proper eating frequency. Number four, total calories. I put this fourth, I put it last for a reason. I'll tell you why. And the fifth being hydration. Many people think this, and I talk about it in RX Nutrition. I say this, folks. If it were as easy as calories in versus calories out, it would be that easy. One more time. If it were as easy as calories in versus calories out, it would be that easy. There's a lot of people out there, because they've come my way, and I've talked to them over the years, that have said, Rick, there's no doubt about it. On X amount of days, I am burning a lot more than I'm putting in. What is going on? Why am I? Sometimes they say, not only am I not getting results, sometimes their body weight's going in the opposite direction. They're actually gaining weight, training more, eating less. It's not all about calories in versus calories out. Yes, it's an important piece of the puzzle, but it's not the only component. We nail these three, folks, the right timing, the right macronutrient combination, and the right frequency. I'm telling you, this will fall into place. We'll start to get some great results. Okay. Let's, let's go back for a second. Let's start breaking each one of these down one by one. I'm actually going to start with number three here, eating frequency. A lot of people hear it, and, and they answer it right in my lectures when I say, hey, okay, how many times a day do we need to eat? Five, six, seven, hands go up, everybody's saying it. It is so true. I want you to think about food like this, folks. Too often, when we're ready to make some body composition changes, we want to lose weight, conventional thinking tells us it's about eating less. Well, maybe sometimes, but many other times, it's about eating more, folks. I want you to think about food like kindling wood for the fire. Think about a fire in a fireplace. You've got a fire burning in there. If we stop throwing kindling wood on that fire, what happens? That fire dies out. What's the fire I'm talking about inside your body? It's your metabolism. It's your metabolism. We want to keep stoking the fire within the body. How do we do that? We've got to feed the body frequently. We've got to keep throwing kindling wood on that fire. That's going to keep the fire burning. I want that frequency to be high. We've got to be putting fuel in that body, folks, every 2.5 to 3.5 hours, and that's from the time that we get up out of bed. Let me address that real quick. Many people, rightfully so, train first thing in the morning. All too often, a lot of individuals, from various reasons, 
do not fuel the body, do not have any caloric source prior to training first thing in the morning. Or if they're not working out first thing in the morning, a lot of people skip breakfast. Sometimes it's the mentality that, oh my gosh, Rick, why would I eat maybe before a workout or maybe I need to skip breakfast. Why would I eat when I'm trying to lose weight? The conventional thinking of eat less, burn more. The minute, folks, we stop throwing wood in that fire, what happens? That fire dies out. The minute you stop throwing food on that body, the metabolism starts to slow. We've got to keep that eating frequency high. That's going to help stabilize our blood sugar, help stabilize our insulin levels, help stabilize serotonin. You've probably all heard of it, sometimes called the feel-good hormone. Let me touch on serotonin real quick because the nutrition and then the next component, rest and recovery, ties in with this. Serotonin is a neurotransmitter, reaction to the brain, affects two main things, affects mood, affects appetite. How many of you out there listening have had food cravings before? I'm sure most of you. Now let me ask you this, when you do have the food cravings, I'm sure it's not grilled chicken breast and steamed vegetables you're, you're craving and brown rice, right? It's the not so good foods for us. Well, so many times we beat our, ourselves up for the food cravings we have, but I'm telling you folks, it's not your willpower. It's not, maybe slightly, but it's not a lack of willpower. It's a hormonal imbalance created in the body from improper nutrition, from a poor eating frequency. That's part of it. And when those serotonin levels drop, the body says, hey, I've got to get these serotonin levels back up. And so it starts to crave those not so good, the simple sugars for us. Ah, the body starts to get satisfied again. But now all of a sudden, we are in this downward spiral that we've got to get out of. So. Keep that eating frequency high, breakfast or pre-training fuel, first thing in the morning. Start there, you're going to stoke that fire. Let's hit this as number two, the nutrient timing because it goes right along with our eating frequency. The timing of the meals, once again, every 2.5 to 3.5 hours, keep wood in the fire, kindle wood in the fire. Think about it like that and you'll hit it. Macronutrient combinations, critical here, carbohydrates, protein and fat. Now. The reason I tell everybody it's not all about calories in versus calories out. That, that, that magic number, so many people ask me, Rick, how many calories do I need to eat? Well, let's say I just give you the magic number, 1,700, 2,000, 2,500, 3,500, whatever it may be, and that's all I tell you. Well, now what? What do you do with all those calories? It's not, the body doesn't work like this. It's not a bank of calories that we have. If, if 2,500 is our goal, well, what do we do with them? What's the timing? What's the frequency? What's the macronutrient combination? That's the key to putting together the right total calories. So with the macronutrient combination, I'll give you some, some what I would call safe percentages for carbs, protein, fat, and certain meals and snacks. And again, this is going to vary. It can vary drastically with each individual depending on their specific needs and goals, their specific body composition. But for virtually every meal and snack, for virtually every meal and snack, we want to have a balanced approach with the macronutrients. Approximately 40 to 60 percent carbohydrates and the protein and fat approximately 20 to 30 percent for each of those. Again, those can vary with each individual, but that's going to be a zone or, or a range that's going to help each and every individual. It's all about the balance. That's where the magic happens. Now, I, I shared with you earlier a big difference between eating healthy and eating right. A lot of people eat healthy. I'll give you, I'll give you a sample day that somebody throws out to me. Okay, Rick, here's what I did today. Um, I woke up, uh, I, I had a yogurt. Um, a couple hours later, I had a handful of nuts. Uh, lunch came around, I had a salad with grilled chicken on it. Uh, a couple hours later, I had a snack. I grabbed a piece of fruit. Uh, dinner came around. I had uh, grilled chicken breast and some vegetables. Healthy? Absolutely. Is it right? Not even close. Not even close. The frequency was good. The timing sounded good. But the macronutrient combination was off. Total calories could have been off as well. This is what makes everything right. All three of these together is what not only makes eating healthy but makes eating right. That's the big key. And once individuals start to cross over and take their healthy eating into eating right, folks, I'm telling you right now, it's almost like magic. All of a sudden, that body starts to change, energy levels start to come back, food cravings are diminished, performance and recovery starts to get better, body fat starts to drop, body weight starts to drop, body water percentage starts to climb. 
those are the things that start to happen. So let's review these once again. Eating frequency, we've got to keep it high. Five, six, seven times a day plus, depends on how many hours we're up in a day. The timing, every 2.5 to 3.5 hours. Macronutrient combinations, I want you to think for every meal and snack, carbohydrates, protein, and fat. Carbohydrates, protein, and fat. I'll give you a quick example. A healthy breakfast, a bowl of oatmeal. Healthy, yes. Is it right? No, it's not right. Why? Oatmeal is only a carbohydrate. We want to add some protein. We want to add some dietary fat. Very easily. What's a good dietary fat to add? Add some nuts to the oatmeal. Boom. Great dietary fat. Add some protein. Bring in some egg whites or egg substitutes. Now what you just did was you just took a healthy breakfast, folks, and you just made it right. Might sound like, man, how can those changes really make a difference? I'm telling you right now that macronutrient combination is phenomenal once we start to put it together with everything. When it comes to the total calories, one thing that really will keep us from overeating is this right here. Because that high eat, folks, if we need to eat every two and a half to three and a half hours, and we're eating that frequently, I'm going to tell you right now, when it's time for the meal and snack, you're going to be at what I would call normal hunger levels, not ravenous, not ready to eat that left arm off, not ready to open that fridge and be like game on, everything I see is going down the hatch, uh-uh. We are going to be of normal hunger levels. Okay, very important, knocking down those three, total calories will fall right into place. Now, the hydration. Hydration has a timing with it as well. It's not just a matter of drinking 60, 70, 80, 100 ounces of water a day. Yes, the amount is important, but the timing is important. So here's what I recommend for everybody. For women, I recommend approximately 16 ounces immediately upon awakening and a minimum of 12 to 16 ounces, 12 to 15 ounces with every meal and snack thereafter. That's kind of the minimum. For men, very similar. 20 ounces upon awakening and a minimum of 16 ounces of water with every meal and snack. That's going to keep us well hydrated. Once again, how can we follow dehydration? We can follow with the body composition scale that we talked about. Okay. Let's go on to the component here of too little repair, recovery, and sleep. I kept the word rest out of here, and I keep it out for a reason, because rest so often, for whatever reason, I get it, has kind of a negative connotation so many times to ask, like, oh, man, Rick, I, I don't want to rest. I've got to, I've got to train. Okay, so let's call it repair then, okay? We're going to recover, and we're going to repair. These are absolutely critical. You heard me talk about serotonin earlier. Well, there's, in my eyes, there's two main things. There's a lot of other things, but two main things that are really going to affect our serotonin levels. One is how we're eating. We've got to eat right, not just healthy. Okay? If we're not eating right, serotonin levels can drop. If we're not getting the proper sleep, serotonin levels can drop. And once again, what happens when those serotonin levels drop? Our food cravings start to go through the roof. And when our food cravings are high, what happens? We tend to overeat. And that is where we start to run into trouble. So the repair, the recovery, and the sleep become a critical component. I've always said this about athletes, folks. I know an athlete has, quote, unquote, arrived when he or she starts to embrace the repair, recovery, and sleep as much as they embrace the hard workouts, the long workouts, and the training in general. I'm telling you right now, start to embrace this, and you'll hit a whole new level. Okay. So we kind of continued here. Cortisol. You probably all heard of cortisol. We talked about serotonin kind of being the, the feel-good hormone. Uh, cortisol, another very important hormone for the body. You can see some things it does for the body here. And again, the sleep, the recovery, the rest, repair have so much impact on the hormone cortisol. Okay? Let's get into the final component here about our beliefs in our mind. This is what I call the mind-body connection. So often... What I call the X's and O's are executed very well by people. They're going to change the way they eat. They're going to change the way they train. They're going to start to follow the proper heart rates. But one thing that can still become an obstacle that we want to work on from day one is, once again, is our mind our biggest asset or our biggest limiter? I want it to become your biggest asset. Let's go over just a few things here about some beliefs that I think will kind of bring to light what I'm talking about. You've probably all heard the name Roger Bannister first individual to break four minutes in the mile back in the early 1950s, if I'm correct. Now, folks, what was the belief? What was the thought? What was the belief about the four-minute mile prior to that? The experts, the scientists all said what? Breaking the four-minute mile is physically, physiologically impossible, right? That was the belief. That was the thought. But what happened 
the minute Roger Bannister breaks the four-minute mile. What happens? X amount, a ton more individuals come by shortly thereafter and break it. Why? The belief, the thought was changed that, oh my gosh, it went from being impossible to being possible. So many times the way we talk to ourselves drives our performance. I'll give you some examples. I've heard so many times over the years people say, well, Rick, you know, I'm, I'm this certain weight uh, because I've got a set point in weight. Well, I'll tell you what, folks. I say this in RX Nutrition. Whether you think you can or whether you think you cannot, you are right. Whether you think you can or whether you think you cannot, you are right. So if you believe, if we believe that this is your set point in weight and you can't get any lower than that, then guess what? You are right. So many people say, well, Rick, you know, I'm, I'm this weight because I'm big boned. Oh, yeah, yeah, my, my mom was big boned and her mom was big boned, and, and that's why I'm the weight I am. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, when we believe that, we're going to continue to reaffirm that belief to be true. Some others in sports, so many people say, I'll have a lot of athletes come to me. Let's say they're a multi-sport athlete, a triathlete, and say, man, Rick, you know what? I can run pretty good, but oh, my gosh, man, I, I'm just a terrible swimmer. Oh, my gosh. That belief they continue to repeat to themselves is a limiting belief, and guess what? Until they change that, the performance is not going to change. So I, I encourage you and I ask you all this. Find in your life where are we setting some of these limiting beliefs? Where do we have some of that self-talk that might not be nearly as positive as it needs to be? Now, I'm not saying it's as quick as flip the light switch and you say to yourself, hey, I'm a, I'm a great swimmer, or hey, now I can climb hills when I couldn't before, or hey, now I'm a great runner and I wasn't before. But it's a start. Start to find where, those, where that negative self-talk is happening. Let's start to change it. Let's start to change those beliefs a little bit, and boom, all of a sudden your mind has now become your biggest asset, and that's how we can start to put everything together. Okay, let's go through some concrete examples of some individuals that put to the test the strength training, the heart rate training, the rest recovery repair, the nutrition, and the mind-body connection, and how their bodies and minds start to change. And the last year, remember this gentleman right here. Okay, here we go. These are always fun. Let's kind of see some good concrete examples. This individual here, 34-year-old female, 182 pounds, starting body fat, 37% body water. Now, these are numbers if you don't have a body composition scale, you may not be aware of, but once you get your body comp scale, you'll say, oh, man, now I know exactly what Rick is talking about. If you're not aware of numbers, that's high. No doubt about it. It's quite high. Mother of two, on a diet roller coaster, lose, gain, lose, gain more. Workout cycle, what type of exercise do you think was the main modality of her exercise? If you said cardiovascular, you are exactly right. What kind of changes do we make? Now you're going to see how everything I just talked about over the last 30 or 40 minutes, how these individuals started to put these things together one by one. I reduced the intensity. Yes, I did not train her easier. I trained her smarter by heart rate. Reduced the intensity and weekly volume of the cardiovascular training. Added strength training three days per week. A small caloric deficit because what was this individual doing on the, on the diet roller coaster, eat less, work out more, keep going in that direction, right? Well, we want to change that, okay? Small caloric deficit. Here's a biggie, folks. I realize conventional thinking says this. When we want to lose weight or lose body fat, people say, oh, man, I, I want to I suppress my appetite. No, no, no. We want to stimulate that appetite. Remember, kindle wood in the fire. Throw the wood in the fire, stoke the fire, stimulate the appetite. Focus on hydration. Balance the carbs, protein, fat, increase the eating frequency. This young lady's calories that I put in front of her, that I prescribed for her, the frequency all much higher. She was actually eating a lot more because she just wasn't eating enough many, many days. Okay, so here we go. Here's the before. Once we start to implement everything, there's the after. You can see right here from the starting weight, starting body fat, here's a nice change from 37% to 21%. That's that's what we're looking for, folks. Drop that body fat percentage. Increase that body water percentage. Lean muscle holds approximately four times more water than fat does. Lean muscle holds approximately four times more water than fat does. So as our body fat drops, our lean muscle is increasing. Therefore, we can increase our body water percentage, okay? Remember this gentleman here because he's next. Okay, here we go.
Client number two, 34 years old, marathoner, physician, or in a busy practice, high stress, long hours, long periods without eating or drinking, ate the majority of his calories at dinner. Remember we talked about the frequency and timing, very important here, okay? Was gaining body fat even though he was training for a marathon, not having the performances that he liked. So there's that gentleman there as a before. What do we do? You're going to see a common theme here, folks. Strength training, increased frequency of eating, added supplementation. When I talk about supplementation, I'm talking about sports-type supplements, whether it's energy bars, whether it's protein powders. A very busy individual, like all of us are, supplementation can be very, very helpful because sometimes we, we just can't get to that exact meal or snack we want, so therefore some of the supplements become great snacks for us. Had him fuel before training. He was not prior to that, okay? We got the hydration, incorporate that pre-training, in-training, and post-training fuel. Balance those meals, time them up for his lifestyle. So, again, a nice change here. Went from a very, very high body fat percentage, and we had a very nice drop right there. So, once again, feeding it more, increasing the frequency, adding the strength training, you can see how the body composition starts to change, the changes that we're looking for. Okay. This individual here in her early 40s, again, a high percentage of body fat, Endurance athlete, I mean, throwing down some miles on the bike, folks, some high miles, okay? Female cyclist was told not to strength train because it would bulk her up again. That's a, that's, a, that's a common thing. It's a common belief. There we go. Back to the beliefs again, right? There's a common belief there. If we believe it, it's going to happen, well, we just may continue to reaffirm that. Had a lot of cravings, would take minimal calories during these long rides. Again, here's a belief. You ready? Thought the weight was creeping up. Due to age, because what do we hear? Oh my gosh, we're in our 40s now, in our 50s, 60s, 70s, etc. We're, we're we're destined to put on body weight. Okay, so here are the changes. Again, big look at this, cutting the cardiovascular down significantly, almost half, if not more. Add the strength training, frequency of eating. Again, one after the next, you just see the common theme. Here we go. So we see the nice drop here, good drop in body fat percentage. That's what we're looking for. And obviously, you can see the body composition change that we're looking for. Let me fly through just two more here, and then we'll close it out and get Melissa on for some questions. Here's another gentleman here. Again, you're going to say, oh, my gosh, some very common scenarios. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of people are doing a lot of the same things out there because, again, it's conventional thinking. We've got a runner, a multi-sport athlete, inconsistent nutrition, restricting calories because, again, conventional thinking says it's all about Calories in versus calories out, but we now know that's not true. Okay? So there's a before. Again, nice after. We did all of the same things. Increased the frequency, added the strength training, proper heart rate training, proper rest, repair, recovery, and again, a nice drop in body fat percentage. Focus on this number, folks, and the body weight. Trust me, will take care of itself. So there's another before and after. Okay. We'll close out with this one right here. Final individual, client number five, high body weight, high body fat. Now, we all know one thing. We can't play ostrich. We can't put our head in the sand. Morbidly obese here, okay? Um, at high risk for cardiovascular disease. We know that. We, we know that high amounts of body fat definitely put us at a higher risk for cardiovascular disease. Sedentary, joints hurt, fatigue quickly, family history. There we go. Cardiovascular disease admits to eating poorly. Okay. There's our starting weight, starting body fat. Now you can see, uh, obviously, a huge change in this gentleman. And so there's our before. And there's our after there. So a nice change. This is what we get, folks, when we eat right, when we train right, proper heart rates, add in the strength training. You can see the good muscular that's built from the strength training, and we start to get some amazing body composition changes. We talked about supplementation. I'll touch on it quickly again. Kind of sum it up into sports nutrition, for lack of a better word. Uh, there are some supplements out there that can be very useful for us, especially as busy individuals. Because remember, if we need to eat every 2.5 to 3.5 hours, we want to make sure we plan ahead. We've got the foods and the supplements we need to keep the body sustained, to keep the Kinley wood thrown on top of that fire. So, folks, I want you all master these five steps, and trust me, you will enjoy every step of your journey. And at Team 2, what we try to do is bridge the gap, help you bridge the gap between where you are and where you want to be. So once again, thank you all very much for attending. Let's take the next 10, 12 minutes and answer some questions. Melissa, are you back on? Yep, I'm on. Can you hear me, Rick? I sure can. I've got you. Okay.
Great. So before we jump into questions, we've got some great questions that we collected from everybody, but I just sure. want to take about two minutes and just point out some, some things in Training Peaks that specifically go along with some of the points that you pointed out. So I'm going to go ahead and take presenter rights back from you, Rick, and I'm just going to share my screen for a second, and then I'll hand it back over to you for questions. Sounds good, Melissa. All right, so just a second, and you guys should start. So you all should be looking at my Training Peaks account right now, and there are several different things that Rick talked about um, that are directly correlated with Training Peaks. For example, um, early in the presentation, he mentioned urine color, which is something that we kind of laugh about here in the office because we actually have a daily metric that you can keep track of, and you can keep track of your urine color. So you can do other things like your body composition and your body weight and the number of hours slept out every night and the way you feel, and we highly recommend that you track those metrics, especially if you're, you're working on your body composition. And I just want to show you how to do that really quickly. Just go into your Training Peaks account and click Add Metrics. And it pulls up your metrics area. If you click on options, it's going to pull up all the options that you have for adding metrics. There's a ton of them. And like I said, one of them is urine color. There's a lot of other ones that you would, you would think are in here, like weight and hours slept. But it's a great way if you're, uh, to hold yourself accountable and see your progress. So I wanted to make sure I pointed that out. And then I also wanted to point out on the dashboard, if you're tracking your nutrition and your weight in your Training Peaks account, in addition to the training that you're doing, there's some great charts on the dashboard that can really help you track your progress. One of them being the metrics. So here you see I'm tracking my weight versus my hours slept. You can also, uh, Rick talked about micronutrients and macronutrients. You can see those. And you also have this chart for daily calories, which is great. It um, just helps you look at what you're consuming and what you're training and how those two balance out together. So I know in that short minute or two minutes, I just flew through a handful of different things. We've got all the information on our support site that really goes into detail on the nutrition and the metrics aspect of your Training Peaks account. So definitely take a look at that. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and, um, Rick, I'm going to give you presenter rights again so you can just put it on, on maybe your contact information or whatever screen you want to end it on. And then I'm going to go ahead and give you some of the questions that we got. So the first cool. question is, Thank you, you're welcome. The first one is, I trained for a long distance endurance event, wanting to lose weight, and I actually gained weight during this time. What do I need to do differently to avoid this from happening again? That, that is a great question, and probably one of the most common scenarios that has you know that individuals bring to my attention over the last many many years, and um, I'll kind of repeat what Melissa said. So it's that individual they're, they're training, or they let's say they already trained for a long distance event, and they're like, okay, Rick, let me tell you what happened last time. I trained for this marathon, half marathon, half Ironman, Ironman, endurance cycling event, whatever it may be, and I thought I was eating healthy. Um, I was training a lot. I wasn't eating a lot. I had a big caloric deficit, and not only did I not lose weight, I actually gained weight. I actually did a podcast on this, and I termed it the Endurance 15, and I kind of piggyback off of what we've all heard over the years called the, the Freshman 15, where the young man or woman goes off to college and uh, you know maybe adopts uh, the college lifestyle, let's call it, and puts on that Freshman 15. Well, the Endurance 15, very similar. We don't want it, we don't want it to happen, and we can prevent it. What most likely happens when we go through these high amounts of endurance training and we actually end up moving in the opposite direction? Everything happened opposite of what we talked about. I can guarantee you this. This is what happens with most individuals. The majority of their training or all of their training was cardiovascular. They were not doing any strength training. They did nothing to build lean muscle. They did nothing to get that metabolism going. Their eating frequency, their nutrient timing was off. They had too many gaps, too many big hours where no kindling wood in the fire, fire started to die out. They were not eating prior to their training. They were not eating enough during their training. And then all of a sudden, the, the serotonin levels are low, um, food craving to the roof. They tend to overeat in that back and forth cycle. So those are the things that happen of why an endurance athlete can put on that kind of weight when they don't want to. So those are the things we want to prevent. Okay. Another one, Thanks, Rick. Yep, I got it. Thank you. Um, I think we have we have time for maybe two more questions. Another one is many times during my bike rides, I avoid taking in calories because I'm trying to lose weight, but I also find that I don't have a lot of energy during many of these rides. What should I do differently? 
Yeah, that's another great question. You know, I, I, again, I think a lot of this too is where our beliefs come into play. And once again, I, I empathize with people. I totally get it. I understand that conventional thinking says, well, gosh, Rick, I'm, I'm battling this within my head. You know, I want to lose weight. Uh, I've got this long ride. I don't, I don't want to eat too much before. I don't want to eat too much during. Why would I, quote, unquote, waste all these calories on the bike? I want to eat more when I come back. And, and they're just kind of battling all these beliefs in their head about, man, eating is going to put on weight, et cetera. Well, this is just where we have to understand that in order to lose weight, in order to change that body composition, we do have to eat. We do have to fuel that body properly. And on that bike ride or endurance training event, yes, we've got to fuel that body because when the body's not fueled properly, like the question said, the energy levels are not going to be there. So that's going to drop performance and recovery, therefore, will not be good. That individual, you can imagine, we've probably all been there before, comes back and guess what? Those hunger levels are now through the roof. What's that cause us to do? Have some crazy food cravings and now we are overeating. So I want people, if, if the belief is, oh my gosh, I just don't want to eat much on the bike because I'm afraid to put on weight, trust me, that is fuel that the body needs and the body will utilize. So once we make that change physically and mentally, good things will start to happen. All right, thanks. And I think we have time um, for one more question. So, and you kind of you covered this, but I think it might be good just to hear like a short summary of your thoughts on it. But uh, the question is, I've been told by many coaches and athletes that lifting weights is not not going to be not going to be beneficial for me as an endurance athlete. Should I or should I not, and why? Yeah, absolutely. I, again, I, I love the topic of, of weight training. And, you know, I welcome these questions all the time, and I love talking to individuals about, you know, again, what, what are their thoughts and beliefs about weight training? What have, what have they been told that uh, they, they believe to be true about the weight training? So in short, my answer is emphatically, absolutely yes, no matter what our goals are, whether it's performance, speed, power, endurance, huge body weight and body composition change and, and body fat loss, the weight training is going to be the number one key. Uh, I want it done frequently. Now, with that being said, too, I don't want individuals to think that this means all my. Here's what a lot of people think too. It's like, oh my gosh, where am I going to fit this into? I'm all. I'm busy. I've got family. I've got kids. I've got business. I've got work. Um, I'm already maxed out training wise. Where do I fit this in? Well, I'm not asking people to take any more time. I'm saying, hey, let's balance what I call that work to rest ratio. Let's put that weight training in there. Maybe we can slide off a little bit of cardiovascular training, but then when I talk about the weight training, I never want somebody to think that this means you need to spend an hour in the weight room. If you if you choose to and, and you've got the time, great. No, 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 though. I'm talking, man, let's get in, let's get out. I want I mean, we got to go into that weight training session with aggression. I mean, nothing short of chewing on the iron. I mean, we want to get in there I'm not talking about, you know, planks and abs and stuff like that. Yeah, that's good, too. I'm talking about weight training. Get in, get out, do a quick, fast circuit, feel the burn, feel the pump. I'm talking 20, 30 minutes. You can have one heck of a full-body workout. So emphatically, yes, we want it done no matter what our goals are. Being, it'll make a big change. Thanks, Rick. You think we have time for, uh, think we have time for one more? Um, yeah, we, we have one more. Um, uh, a handful of people have been asking about if there's a cutoff during the day or during the evening, like what's the latest somebody should be eating? Oh, man, that, thank you so much for that question. That is absolutely phenomenal because, once again, you know, I, I'm sharing with you what I've heard so much over the years and individuals have shared with me, well, Rick, I've, I've believed or I've been told that, um, you know, don't eat past five, six, or seven. Uh, other people say, well, I stop eating uh, carbohydrates after a certain hour, or, uh, man, if I, if I eat you know, late at night, uh, I'm going to put on weight. So, okay, let's, let's just kind of streamline this, say, okay, what, what is true, what is not, what's going to work? I don't have a cutoff time, and the reason being is every individual is so different. So let's go back to one thing. Let's go back to the timing. Every 2.5 to 3.5 hours. So I'll share this with you. Let's look at where our dinner time falls. Let's say an individual has dinner around 6.30, okay, 6.30 p.m. at night. And they're not going to bed until 10.30, 11 o'clock, okay? Well, eating at 6.30, not going to bed till 10.30, that's a four-hour gap. Now, add that four-hour gap on top of, I'm hoping we're sleeping, you know, I know a lot of people don't get enough sleep, but let's say we're sleeping seven, eight hours. Oh, my gosh, now we have an 11, 12-hour gap of not eating. So if that dinner's at 6.30 and you're not going to bed for another four hours, 
2.5 hours later, folks, boom, I, I want you and I will prescribe for individuals that post-dinner snack. Now, the, the amount is not going to be a lot, but it's going to be just enough to fuel that body and facilitate recovery at night. So if we're eating the right things, remember, not just healthy, if we're eating the right things and the timing's right, you got it, even at that hour. Great, thank you. Um, so we just have two minutes left, and I just want to close with uh, some more housekeeping type things. We had a lot of questions that Kelly and I weren't able to get through, and a lot of them are specific Training Peaks questions regarding your account. So if you, if you have these type of questions, go to our website and click on Support, and then just click on Contact Us. And it's the main page here, and just shoot us an email and ask us your question. We're not gonna we're not gonna be able to answer everyone that came in through the webinar, so go here and submit your question. And um, yeah, that's it. Oh, and also, sorry, this webinar will be archived, and if you want to listen to it again, just go to the same place, go to support, go to personal edition, and we've got the webinar page here, and also list the webinars that we have upcoming. So we've got one next week with Joe Friel, who's going to be going over the methodology and the back the background for creating your annual training plan. And then we've got some great ones that are in the works for January, February, and March. So keep an eye on this page and we'll be listing our upcoming webinars there. So with that and, and in closing I want to thank um, Dr. Katu for doing the presentation and for taking us all through this. And uh, we really appreciate it, and I'm glad everyone is able to attend. So thank you. Thank you, Melissa, and thank you, everybody, for attending.